Hello, hello, Claudia. Hello, hello. Uh, and good afternoon, Alexis. And good afternoon, Eric. And good afternoon, Brandon. Good afternoon, Logan. Oop, sorry. Oh, good. Wait. Um, okay, one second. So, oh, sorry, I didn't mean, uh, I said something in my name. All right, good afternoon, Alexis. Good afternoon, private chat people. Good afternoon, Brandon. Good afternoon, Logan. Good afternoon, Claudia. Of course, good afternoon, Maria. Oh, she from the convent. Okay, from the, yeah, as she said. Okay, hope it's going well. Okay, uh, good, I said, Claudia. Good afternoon, Victoria. Good afternoon, Stephanie. <laughs> Excuse me. Good afternoon, Paulina. Good afternoon, Jenna. Good afternoon, Joseph. Uh, good, good morning. Good, good time concept, Josephine. Good afternoon. That was rude on my part. I didn't mean it that way. Uh, good afternoon, Katie. Good afternoon, Muhammad. Uh, good afternoon, Maria. I said right. Good afternoon, Emily. Okay. Um, and bear with me for a second. Actually, uh, did I say Christina? Good afternoon, Chris. Did I say that? Okay. And I know she's also zooming in from another location. So thank you. Totally noted and appreciated. Um, I mean, we're all zooming in from other locations. You know what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. We're going to start in a second. Um, bear with me for a second. I'm actually, oh, 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 oh. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. There's something in the chat. Oh, that's a fair question. Uh, uh, actually, that's a welcome question in a way. The, the to Jenna's question in the public chat: Are we able to make up work? Wait, okay. There's many things in the chat now. Okay, are we able to make up work even after the midterm? Yes. If you mean like homeworks that were due before the midterm, can you still turn them in either because they were never turned in or for a higher score? The answer is yes. Uh, it's actually a really good question. Yes. Um, as to whether that's worth it or not, that might be a discussion. Like, depending on your situation, depending on what you're talking about, you might want to reach out to you, anybody. I mean, Jenna or anybody might want to reach out to me personally to see how worth it that is because things move faster and faster, like like all the time in physics and the work piles up and very soon we're going to be worried about the final and the final is not everything in physics is cumulative, but technically the final is not technically cumulative. Like if you, it, it, you know what I'm saying? Like it explicitly examines whatever material we do between the midterm and the final. So it, in some of your cases, it may not be worth it to worry about homework that, um, was sort of meant as practice for the midterm. But yes, it is allowed. As long as the portal is up there, you can do it. I'll also be strict as long as we're asking about that. Once we get toward the final, to the end of the semester, then there's deadlines about when the last bit of work can come in before final exams, like the last day of classes. And I am strict about those because there's no time to grade everything uh, at all. Um, so I am, when we get to the end, then strictness occurs. But yeah, anyway, yes, the answer is yes. Now, hold on, there's other things in the chat. And then I do want to, there's something private chat to remove. We, yes, today we are moving forward. I mean, if I ever get talking, we, yes, material wise, we're moving forward today. And, and I will address the midterms in a moment, for a moment. But we're not going to say anything really explicit about the midterms. We're not going over it until or or at least until you get it back which is a little bit of an i'm going to move as fast as i can to get these back but unfortunately again they happened in all of my classes just like with you guys there were midterms in all of my classes at the same time which i really tried to avoid but failed to do so so uh, there's a and these things are long as you experience anyway i'm going to move as fast as i can to get them back to you but it won't be as fast as i want or as fast as you want um, like they're not going to be back in two days. I, I can tell you that. Um, so we're not going to talk about them in any explicit way until you get it back. So yes, we're moving on for good or for bad. That's the deal. I'm also just looking at more in the chat. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, no, right. Okay. Also on homework, 
any homework, any homework that you've gotten feedback on and still want to improve your score based on the feedback, yes, that is still allowed. But any homework where you got a score but you didn't get feedback, right, that means I still owe you either feedback or a higher score. And those are still coming and those will still be adjusted. Um, and you can, if there's a particular homework that any of you is wondering about, like you noticed on a particular homework, you got a score, but you never got feedback. So, and it was less than perfect score. You're right. That's how I do. I get a, an initial score first and then go back. So if there's any particular homework that any of you is particularly concerned, you can like send me a gentle reminder or something like that. But yes, if you ever got a number without feedback, that either means you're getting feedback or soon you're getting a higher number. Um, so that's true. Okay, wait. Oh, thank you for the clarification. And thank you for the thank yous. Okay, bear with me for a second. I think that's the question. I'm actually, weirdly or not, I'm going to pause. I never, this is a new experiment. I'm I'm going to walk away for a second just to adjust something. And then I, say, I do want to say like a thing or two about the midterms. That's not, whatever. Um, so I'm going to pause the recording for a second. I don't know if that works. I think that works. Hold on one second. Thanks now. Okay. I'm mean, obviously if there's more questions, you can let me know. Um okay, well, we're getting to physics. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, no, cool. So some people are responding in the chat. No, I totally mean it. And if I sound weird, again, it's because I I look exams freak me out too. And and um and I was and honestly, like 10 minutes ago, I was like, where are all the exams? What's going on here? But they all came in. So well done. I mean, no, I do mean it. And I really mean it that people in the I don't know what kind of number you're going to get, folks. You might get a number that like puts in context. You might get a number that you don't love. It, 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 there's a lot. Anyway, I already made the point, but it's true. OK, don't let this ex just be proud of yourself for doing this exam and don't let it suddenly give you a whole wrong idea of if you're here right now you belong in this course it's basically what i'm saying and if you're worried about the course you belong in the course nobody ever takes these courses without worrying about them unless they're crazy okay um okay 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 so what we're gonna do um is this now we're gonna move now to something that you already started in lab i believe many of you have started in lab maybe you could tell me in the private chat and i always get the anyway I mean, we're getting now to Newton's laws of motion. Of course, you heard about them in high school. I'm sure you heard about them in middle school. Um, let's get some context here. Okay, just a quick historical context because it's vaguely interesting. Galileo lived and worked um, in various different cities in the country that we now call Italy. I think they might have called it that then too. I'm not even sure. Um, uh, and he died in 1642. Uh, at, at the end of 1642, on the day that m most historians say it was on Christmas of 1642, there's actually a little bit of debate and some question. There was some, a little bit of uncertainty surrounding uh, this date, but many people agree that on Christmas of the same year that Galileo died of 1642 in a different country, what we now call England, what I think they then called England, uh, Isaac Newton was born. OK, um, so the torch gets passed uh, from Galileo to Newton and, and and Newton, just like Galileo, Newton ultimately is very prolific, produces and publishes ultimately publishes many, many works. The biggest uh, the biggest work um, or the, the work that survives to today with perhaps the most historical and mathematical and scientific impact is a, a huge volume called the Principia Mathematica. Um, and then that title gets reused like centuries later by Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead. It's like it because it's such an important work that even the title gets resurrected to make other works 
of, of equal sort of depth and, and breadth um, and seriousness in, in the mathematical, philosophical, scientific world. Okay, but his is called the Principia Mathematica. It is where Newton develops, among many, many other things, the, 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 um, the statements that we now regard as his laws of motion, right? You've heard of Newton's laws of motion. Of course, you're already using them in the lab. I'm aware of that. Um, they can be phrased many different ways. There, this, this whole work is in Latin. It's not in English or Italian. Um, so anything I say here is like a translation of a translation of a translation in a way. Um, what I want to do is do a quick overview of the three laws for you today. Um, hopefully this won't be too, too much mind crunching math today, but the laws set us up to be able to mathematically solve problems um, for the rest of time in physics. Um, there's three laws, as again, you may know, it's the set, I'm going to do them in order, don't worry, and I'm going to write down notes, don't worry, I know I'm talking a little fast right now, but uh, the second of those three laws is the most directly mathematical of the three laws. It's the one that we use to solve problems forever from here on in. That's the second law. So it's the most mathematically productive. But the context for the second law, I think, is very much set up by both the first and the third. So I'm going to I'm going to tell you them in order. Again, I'm assuming that you've sort of heard these in a way before, but I'm like everything else, I'm trying to put it into a context for you in this class. I'm trying to put it in the context both of the larger idea of relativity, which never, ever goes away in physics. Uh, but I'm also trying to put it in the context of how do we solve basic physics problems. Um, those are the two threads always in this class, like relativity and how to solve problems. So, so I, I guess I'm saying, I'm going to start taking notes now. You please take notes with me. Even if you think you've heard some of these things before, please write them down our way anyway. The, I, even if you, you know, the idea is to hear about them our way. That doesn't mean you have to like our way better than any other way that you've ever heard, but it does mean you have to know both your way and our way. So you can ultimately make an informed choice of <laughs> what you like. And okay, anyway, so. I'm first going to give you Newton's first law. Hello, hello, hello. What just happened? Okay. Hello, hello. Okay. Newton's first law of motion. I don't know why it's of. And it doesn't mean it's the first thing he ever said or anything like that. I don't know what just happened to my pen. It. it but anyway, it's the first law of motion, and and here it is. Okay, now this part you've heard before, 
There's new news for us. I put in brackets the, the words that are in brackets. You don't even have to include. They're sort of redundant, actually. I I don't even know why I wrote them, but um, but I will say this. Um, I want you to notice the way we. There's many different ways to write it, but the way we write it here, it has sort of three parts. The first part is almost is the conditions or the constraints for the law. The first part is tells you when this law does or does not apply. So the first part says, unless subjected to a net external force, an object or a mass at rest state. Sorry, the first part says, unless subjected to a net external force, like that is the constraint. Any object that is subjected to a net external force, this law doesn't apply to. This law only, okay, so it's like the domain of discourse. We're only talking about objects, masses that are not um, uh, subjected to net external forces. That's the first thing to understand. Um, then once you establish that we're talking about objects that are not subjected to net external forces, and I have to define what that means. Um, unless, assuming we're talking about objects that are not subjected to net external forces, then we're dividing into two cases from there. We're branching the tree in two ways from there. We're saying an object at rest stays at rest. And of course, you've heard this before, but an object at rest stays at rest. And an object in motion stays in motion at the same speed in a straight line, i.e. at in the same speed at the same direction, right? Okay. You've heard it a million times, but what, what do I want to say about this? What could I possibly add to this? Um, that you haven't heard before, haven't thought before. Well, Okay, first thing I want to say is that constraint, no net external forces, I'm going to define net external forces kind of in a more rigorous way shortly. But for the moment, or at first impressions, or on a basic level, when we say not subjected to net external forces, what we really mean is, I, I think what the English sounds like it means, we mean being left alone. What we're really defining here when we say the constraint on this law, when we say whatever this law is, whatever prediction we're making about how objects move, we're first of all, we're talking about when they're not being forced from the outside by anything. So what we're really saying is, here's what we're about to predict is the natural state of objects. What do we mean by natural? We mean what an object would do if literally left alone. That is, if it's not interacting with any other object. This, okay, ultimately a net external force ultimately is gonna be an interaction, a push or a pull that comes from the outside. That's what external means outside. Well, how could a push or a pull like come from the outside? It would have to come from another object. So the first thing I just want you to recognize whenever you think about Newton's third, first law, it's talking about what we expect a object, a mass to do if it's by itself. If it's 
not in interacting with any other such object or mass. Okay. And then with the law, and then the law goes into two cases. It's fine. Once you're establishing a we're talking about an object by itself. We're gonna make we're gonna say then that that two possible things could be happening. Either the object could be sitting around, in which case we're predicting that it's going to continue to sit around, or the object could be moving. I mean, it could be not sitting around, which would be moving, in which case we're going to predict that it's going to continue to be moving in exactly the same way as it's moving right now. Now, it's that second case that's really kind of the surprise. I mean, it literally is the surprise. The Oh, oh sorry, I'm looking in the chat to see. Oh, 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 sorry. After we are, we are. What's the word? Oh, we are, oh, sorry, dividing. We are dividing. Sorry. Uh, um. It's almost like the DVD. Huh. Oh, wow. Yes, I think I know what Katie means. If she said, I thought she meant for a second, my handwriting was like the, which it probably is. But if Katie means this great, and you should really give yourself like submit for points for this, Katie. If Katie is saying that what the law is, sounds like it's saying is like how that DVD symbol or whatever on your screen, when your screen is idle, like that bouncy thing. Yeah. If this is describing that bouncy, you're right. I agree with you. Or put it, if people don't know what we're talking about or whatever. I'm, I'm even surprised I know what she's talking about. But uh, in other ways, what we're describing here is like what a hockey puck would do on ice, really, really good, like Zamboni ice, like freshly Zamboni ice, or like what a puck would do on an air hockey table, which is perhaps maybe the best example, right? Yes, like the, something that's in motion, but not being subjected to outside forces, not being touched or pulled or pushed or rubbed or slid upon by anything else something that's really, like really free a free object like a puck on a like her dvd example and tell me if i mean i think that's what she's talking what katie's talking about right so okay so i'll develop this for a second so so i when i say air hockey i mean like like a big table where there's it deliberately like air coming out of the holes in the table so that, so the air is going up, right? Like being blown up perpetually, like on a good air hockey table. Um, and so there's like this cushion of air, very, very thin, but thick enough to separate a puck from the actual harsh surface, right? And so on a good hockey, uh, air hockey table that's like working properly, there is air coming out all the time. And that air might even be, those air molecules might even be influencing, forcing the puck a little bit in an upward direction. But if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, the whole idea is that they're forcing the puck a little bit away from the table so the puck's not rubbing on the table. And then the, in a good ideal situation or in a good situ expensive situation, the puck is then what, what the air cushion has done is sort of removed any kind of horizontal rubbing or sliding or frictional effects from the puck. So even though the air is there and do, like giving a little vertical upward force or lift to the puck, that's just enough to sort of balance the weight of the puck, the gravitational pull of the puck. And so on a good air hockey table, what you're paying for, so to speak, is your... <laughs> paying to remove horizontal influences from the puck. So once the puck, uh, until you hit it or until, right? So once you hit the puck, it goes in a straight line at a largely constant speed, like until it hits a bumper, a wall or something, or hits the other person's <coughs> um, contraption, their bumper, their hockey stick, which isn't really a stick. Right, it goes until it hits something. Excuse me, <laughs> and when and as soon as it hits something, it bounces off. But that right, and it definitely does bounce. But then starts going in another direction and continues to go in a pretty much a straight line and pretty much a constant speed. 
So I'm um, wait. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean the air. Do I really want to say it's negligible? It's not so much that it's negligible. Well, certainly, what the air is doing is providing a vertical um, influence. So certainly, the air, if it's doing the right thing, it's really. I mean, it's not doing anything horizontally. Like there's a million little air holes, and they're all like pushing up. So even if, if one air hole is kind of pushing that way a little bit, then the one next to it is pushing in the opposite way a little bit. So. Yeah, the horizontal effects of the air are most certainly negligible. That's the idea. And the vertical effect of the air, it's not so much that it's negligible, it's that it's just enough to match gravity or to match the weight of the puck. So yes, the net, and this is one of the reasons, I guess I'm getting a little bit off, but when we say net external forces, I will define it rigorously, but external means from the outside, force means influence, push or pull from another, push or pull. And net means what's left over after all the balancing has been taken into account, right? Like net really means add everything up, but take into account minus signs. That's really what net means. It, it means add everything up, but take into account minus signs. So, so yeah, I guess what I'm arguing right here is an air hockey table is a good, is a very good example of, or what an air hockey table does to a hot air hockey puck is an extremely real world, effective example of of newton's first law in action where yeah there there may be external forces that make this whole thing work but there aren't net external forces on the hockey puck and please as long as you're asking i'm glad you're asking please like let me know in the chat if oh, oh okay 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 oh okay 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 cool 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 thank you alexis and other people uh, oh wait and, and there's that's a good example i'm just looking at reading the chat okay great 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 so i'm i'm glad I don't know if I want to write this down, but no, I'm glad you're pressing. Okay, well, I will write part of this down. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm going to dwell on this for a minute. I'm looking at the time. I'm going to dwell on this for, like, it's interesting and good that you guys are sort of pressing me on the air hockey example or pressing me on any example of the second part of Newton's first law. I mean, let's get it. Oh, 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 sorry. Wait, I'm looking at the chat again. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Wait, wait. Okay, so Muhammad's question is good in the chat, but I, I, it's very good and very on the point of this. But I guess what I'm saying is I don't think the puck is stopping. Like, like, like in a good air hockey table, the puck doesn't stop. I mean, if, if the air hockey table is good, like if it's clean and everything, the idea is that the air the puck doesn't generally stop until it hits something, um, or 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 falls into a goal. Like, and if it does stop, put it another way. If the puck suddenly stops in the middle of the table, like you go to an arcade and you're playing with someone and then the puck gets stuck in the middle of the table and you have to reach out, that's like annoying, right? Like that's a fail 
on the part of the table. Like you get annoyed when that, you know, something's wrong when that happens. It's not the table doing what the table's supposed to do, right? And maybe you even complain if it happens enough where you say this table sucks. I'm not using this table. It's part of my language. But like what we all know is, in, I think, in the general case of the exact the exact experience that you're signing. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, well, okay. So I'm saying as far as when you're playing and, it, and I, I, I'm seeing Muhammad's response, I'm looking, and this is a perfectly good discussion to have, and I'll see Claudia's response in a second. But I, I'm not, now I'm in the world here with you guys. We're in the world. We're in physics. We're not in a math class, right? So of course, on the one hand, you're very, you're all very right to press me on, hold on, like how realistic are like you being, like, are we talking about the real world here? Because like we should be, because it's physics, not just math in our heads, but also we're talking about the real world here, right? So in air hockey, am I saying that the puck will literally, literally like never, ever stop to the end of the universe when all time? No, I'm not necessarily saying that. Maybe only in math can we talk about like to infinity or to eternity or something. But what I am saying, and I'm not trying to weasel out of it, what I am saying is, well, wait, when you play a game of air hockey, a game of air hockey, so think of, so you're being scientists now, now you're having fun, so you're playing a game, but you're being scientists, you're making measurements, right? Like you're keeping score. In other words, like you, you are actually trying to enumerate things that are happening in the physical world when you're, and, and so just like in real science, what what we our access to the truth and our concern for the truth or our way of evaluating the truth is through measurements, right? Well, similarly in a game, am I literally saying that the puck is literally never ever 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 going to stop? I don't know because I'm not going to live long enough to know that. But I think if it's a good air hockey table, I and and it's not broken, I think a that the air hockey puck will keep going in the context of the game until something that's supposed to happen in the game happens, like somebody hits it or it hits a corner of the table or a side of the table or whatever, right? Like I think for any individual, and I'm not trying to be, I am trying to be technical in a way. I'm trying to draw a distinction between science and math. I'm, if we're trying to be real worldly about this, which we are, then we want to be real worldly and say, we don't care about eternity or infinity or things in our head as such. We care about the experimental context or what is observable in front of us. And I would claim, A, that in a good air hockey table, the puck does last. It doesn't spontaneously slow down while it's moving from my goal to yours, or it's not supposed to. And if it does, we say it's a bad game or a bad table. We're, we rely on it. We expect it, once we hit it, to keep going in a straight at the same speed like we make shots based on that expectation right and it and so a if it's a good table it'll keep going in a straight line at the same speed and embody newton's first law right b the better the table the more this will be true right and that's actually super important it's sort of how newton came to these and galileo came to these conclusions in the first place we're not talking about perfection or i or infinity or anything right now that would be math i mean i'm not saying i'm not into talking about that but we're trying to develop laws of motion in the measurable experimental observable empirical world so all that we can make claims about is like what we can measure so the real claim here is on a regular, like on a regular circumstance, on a wooden floor, if you put a, on a wooden floor, if you put a puck down on a wooden floor and like hit it, it would go a little ways, but it would of course start slowing down and, uh, and, and stop right on a wooden floor. So I'm backing up and I will look at the chat in a second, but as long as we're talking about this, I want to make this... On a wooden floor, the puck would go, you would see it slowing down and it would stop eventually. So you might say, well, see, and you might say what people for centuries and centuries in history said. You might say, well, see, objects don't like to keep going at the same speed in, a, in the same direction. They naturally want to stop, right? If you just looked at a puck on a floor, on a wooden floor, you could join thousands and thousands of millions of people, very, very smart, reasonable people throughout history who looked at objects and said, it seems like what objects naturally want to do is slow down and come to rest. But you look at the floor and you say, well, wait a second, the 
floor, I think, is having some influence on the object. Like, it's not helping the object that it's on a wooden floor. In fact, if I'm really interested in what the object's natural motion is, if I'm interested in what the object would do left to its own, not being influenced by pushed or pulled by other objects, what I should at least acknowledge is that the floor might be rubbing against it in some sort of frictional way in the real world, right? The floor might be having an influence on it. It might be the floor that's slowing down that object a bit. Maybe it's not the object itself. Maybe it's a relationship with the floor. So what you might do and what Newton did, and of course people before him, but what you might do is start by polishing the floor somewhat. Right, you might make the floor or, or or replacing the wood with linoleum or something. If you're being scientific, you might say, wait, I feel like why this puck is slowing down is not a property of the puck itself. I feel like maybe it's something else touching the puck. So let me shave down that other thing that's touching the puck and make it smoother. So you might make the floor smoother. And then what would you see? Would you see that the puck goes forever, forever, forever and never slows it? No, you wouldn't. You would see the puck go farther, take longer to slow down, right? And get farther before it comes to a rest completely. So then you polish the floor more or you make better technology. And now you've gone from like wood to linoleum to to uh, to glass or something. And then eventually, like centuries after Newton, maybe you even make, you even have the technology to make an air cushion for that object. And so what you notice, so I'm just going to write this down. I know but this is sort of, I'm a rabbit, I, 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 this, but this is worth saying. Like, how does Newton come to believe or defend the second case, the second, the moving case in the measurable real world? Well, A, this idea that I'm saying right now, which is called successive approximations. This is where the science of physics and the calculus of math meet up. Successive approximations is trends, looking at trends in the limit. First of all, what I'm saying, and I know there's a lot that happened in the chat. I will go back to the chat in a second, but I do, I think this is worth addressing. The first thing I'm saying, I'm not saying, I, I'm saying that the less and less friction you subject a puck to, the more and more the puck embodies this prediction. The, the less some other object rubs the puck, the farther the puck goes without slowing down or stopping, which suggests, a, like you can make a graph out of it. It suggests that what's re strongly suggests and starts to support more and more that what's slowing the puck down is not the puck, it's something else. And the better job we do of getting rid of that something else, the more we see the puck maintain a constant velocity. Now you may or may not and, and what I would ultimately argue is, we even in Newton's time, but certainly now, we have technology like air hockey tables that are not perfect. Not, of course, no nothing in the, in the, in the uh, measurable world is perfect, but in the measurable world, we have technology that is good enough not only to demonstrate this pattern, to demonstrate that the less something else interferes with an object, the, the more an object is left alone, the more it would tend to maintain constant velocity. But we even have technology that is good enough to, to reveal that that object will maintain constant velocity within the parameters of our measuring equipment. I mean, that's a huge point. And I, if I'm not careful, I could go on for like hours again. But like, in other words, we could say in the limit, as the external forces approach zero, as the net external forces approach zero, then the velocity of the object approaches constancy. And what that really means in English is, that whether in the context of playing a game, basically in English it means one, two, one of two things. If you're playing the game, the puck is going to stay at constant velocity well enough for you to do a better, you'll do better in the game if you rely on that assumption. If you expect Newton's law first law to be true while you're playing you're going to do a much better job in the game than if you then if you expect 
Like, in other words, if the guy shoots at you, I mean, I'm getting all excited now, but like the, if the, if your opponent shoots at you and you're standing there about to defend your goal, I'm assuming people can picture air hockey. I mean, it's like hockey, but on air, I don't know what to say, but if someone shoots at your goal and the thing's about to go in your goal and you stand there and you like to say, I've joined Aristotle and all the, the, the philosophers from before Galileo's time and before noon's time and i expect that the natural tendency of a of an object is to eventually come to rest that objects actually of their own volition want to be stationary and that's what i expect and you think to yourself even though newton's first law sort of sounds kind of something interesting it definitely doesn't apply in the real world it's only some sort of perfection mathematical infinitude thing so i actually believe that given enough time objects will by themselves come to rest so you stand there while the object is coming to your goal and you're like my physics says that that thing is going to slow down eventually come to rest well it's gonna you're gonna lose right because the thing is not gonna slow down enough in your lifetime let alone in your moment in the game for it to stop before it goes in your goal it's gonna go in the goal i mean i'm like yelling like a crazy person but what i'm trying to say is on a practical level you totally rely on newton's for uh, we if we play air hockey rely or regular hockey we rely on Newton's first law to be far more true than false. And if we made actual measurements, if the ice is shaved down well enough or we're in a lab with a good enough vacuum, are we saying that the thing doesn't lose any velocity at all? No, maybe it does, but it doesn't lose enough velocity to be picked up on our measuring instruments, right? If the, And that's all we can believe in science is what our measuring instruments say. So the first thing I'm saying is that Noon's first law, the second part of it, oh, yes, you should be pressing on me. And I'm going to chat in a second. It is worth, absolutely worth talking about for a minute because the second part is the surprise. What no one's surprised about is that an object sitting still will not spontaneously start moving or speeding up or something. Like people have believed that for centuries. But oh, indeed, did people believe, but did people, Aristotle did not say that it was a, that this was a law. He said the opposite. Aristotle looked in the world and believed that objects tended on their own to come to rest, that their natural state they were pursuing was stationariness. But what Galileo and Newton, well, specifically Newton, is coming along and saying, um, that's not actually what I, it looks like that a lot in the world, because a lot, when you look in the real world, you're really generally looking at objects interacting with each other. Specifically, you're generally looking at objects on floors or on surfaces where they're being affected by friction. But the more you get rid of the interaction with other objects, the more you find that what an object wants to do, what an object does when it's by itself, is it maintains constant velocity even when it's moving. This second part of the law is the surprising part. It is the part that you should press me on. It's the harder part to set up in the real world and to picture in your mind. But if you really think about it, what we're saying is what's hard to set up is to get rid of the intrusion of other objects. If But if we really want to study a first, a base case, like a control case, if we're looking at motion, How does motion work in the world? If we're eventually going to look at how objects affect other objects, and we will, then we first want to set up a base case of what objects would do when they're not interacting. Last breath I'm going to, last thing I'm saying, then I look in the chat is because, and the reason I'm getting so intense in an excited way, I mean, not, I'm not, I'm like, I'm glad you guys are pressing me. This used to super bother me too. Anytime in in friction, in physics, when I got to something where it sounded like they were saying, oh, no, 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 but you're thinking too complicated. You're thinking too realistically, Averbaum, or like you're in the real world, but we're setting up like an ideal case first. Of course that bothered me, whether consciously or as articulately as it bothers you guys or not, I don't know. But of course it bothered me. Part of my brain shut down every time someone sounded like they were talking about an ideal case. I would think half consciously, well, uh, that's fine, but then I, you're not talking about science, and then this crap has nothing to do with the world to me. Like, I can memorize what you're saying, but I thought this was supposed to be about the world. I guess it isn't. Okay, no. Let me just say, the reason I get all excited about this is this is about the world, but the way we analyze the world is one piece at a time. The reason this is the first law, and I will look at the chat and I will move on after I look at the chat, but the reason this is the first law is we're just saying if we want to ultimately study how objects interact with each other and affect each other's motions, 
we need a control first. We need to separate the variables. First, we need to understand what they seem to do in the limit as we do our best job of getting rid of intrusion. So first we establish the natural case of what an object by itself would do. Then in our next two laws, believe me, and in all the rest of physics, we'll then bring in the other factors. But our whole program in physics is we don't look at everything at once because then we can't look at anything. We certainly believe in acknowledging friction, but we believe in acknowledging friction by bringing it in as a second factor or as a factor once we first know what things would look like without the friction. That's why we can study what the friction effect is. Okay, anyway, I'm gonna look at the, So I'm trying to say the, the first law, I'm trying to acknowledge first law. The second part of it is the surprising, sort of harder to get our mind around part, the part that seems less realistic. I'm arguing that it is a leap you, we do want it, but it is true and it is realistic. I'm going to argue something even deeper than that in a moment, but all right, I'm totally looking at the chat now. I'm sorry. Here we go. Well, I told, well, I'm glad it's a discussion day. That actually is appropriate. Okay. Maybe secretly, some people are just like discussing. So that they're like, don't bring in any equations. My head can't handle an equation. They're fine. I understand that. Oh, anyway, there's an air hockey. I'm looking at, oh, the air is negligible. That was before you explained it. I think it was Greek. Okay. Thank you. And then Muhammad Singh. So we'll never stop. I don't know if I address Muhammad Singh or not, but I'm saying it. Maybe we'll stop, but it'll stop outside the bounds of our measurement. And what's making us scientific in real world here is measurement is the arbiter of truth. So I, that's my answer to Muhammad. I, it's a great question. I don't know if he accepts that answer or not. Okay, now Claudia. Okay, I think of air resistance. Yeah, okay. So like, I agree with Claudia. Wait. She, oh, okay, Nancy. And I agree with Nancy. She's going to switch devices quickly. She's probably back already by the time I even saw that. But okay, uh, Claudia... In reality, air resistance does act. Like yeah, in reality, Claude, um, air resistance does act on it in reality. But again, I just I want to, I just want to. I know I've said this. There's this whole thing like physics is like math applied to the real world of space and time, right? And we often say things in math that seem super. Math is just in our mind, not just. I mean, but math is the perfect cases. Physics, right, is dealing with the imperfect cases, but I just want to remind everybody again that what makes it physics, as opposed to just like daily life, is that physics is about measurements. So as long as things can be true, like the extent to which things are not um, desirable, as long as our measurements, as long as that's outside... As long as we could continually keep our measurements more precise than our imperfections, then we're progressing in science. I don't know. I, there's other ways. I, basically, I am saying this. In the real world, it is very possible to create an air hockey table or like a low friction device that doesn't perfectly get rid of friction, but but gets rid of friction to the point where you can't measure any problem at all, like where things will slow down by a rate that is smaller than your measuring equipment can pick up on. So from a measurement standpoint, you've create you've embodied the physics law. I, that's a bit, but yeah, okay, okay. I, I, I don't know if that, but now here's my real point. Okay, it's 112 already. Here's my real point. I This will maybe really bringing it to focus for some people. So my first, so A, at the bottom of the page here says like one way that Newton came to think about this. And yes, it was a revolutionary idea. Again, remember there's two cases. One is things sitting still, keep sitting still. Yes, everybody expected him to, everybody expects that. But things moving won't slow down or come to rest. Right, that is a surprising thing to say. It's harder to picture. You need better, more isolated conditions to picture that but it is the limiting case. So why did Newton even say that at all? If it's that hard to picture, and of course his technology wasn't as advanced as ours, he didn't have an air hockey table. So, so really, how did Newton come to say that at all? Here's how.
Note this. What I really want to say is if you re the real reason Newton established this as a law, the real reason that the real reason that Newton said in one case, when you're sitting still, you'll keep sitting still, same speed, same direction. In this other case, when you're moving, you'll keep moving, same speed, same direction. What Newton's really telling us is Actually, those are both the same case. Actually, I take Galileo's principle of relativity, my predecessor, Galileo, I take his principle so seriously that I'm now turning it into a law. What Newton's really saying, if you really think about it, is there's no difference between the seeming rest case and the moving case. What he's really saying is whether you have a velocity of zero or a velocity of something, either way, the law is saying you're going to maintain constant velocity. He's right. If you really think the result is the result that he's claiming, the prediction is no matter what, objects maintain constant velocity unless acted on by other objects. But what he's saying is he's saying is zero is not a special case because there is no such thing as something objectively being at speed zero. Zero is in the eye of the beholder. This is the whole Galileo point, and it's a deep point. I'm telling you, no matter what you ever do in physics, in some way, it all comes back to this recognition. It's a super powerful recognition. Um, I'm saying this, I'm saying, We're saying any object to itself is at rest and any object to anything else that isn't in the same frame of reference is not at rest. There is no object that is objectively sitting still. If we're going to talk about an object that's sitting still, we just mean according to a certain frame of reference. I'm, so, so, so this is what I'm saying is if you really take Galileo's principle of relativity seriously, Newton's first law has to be true. It has to be true that objects in motion don't behave any differently from objects at rest, but they both, all those objects, will just maintain constant velocity because the only way to, because the way to change an object from being at rest, the way to look at one case versus another would just be a matter of what you're doing while you look at the object. And I'm really serious about this. I'm going to say this once. And I want you to think about it because it's still to this day this freaks out my mind in a way. Like it's not obvious, but it is sensible when you think on it enough. Think about this. If we all know that we would never expect an object that's just sitting, an object that's just sitting still on the table, we all agree that it's going to keep doing that. 
unless something else comes along and pushes it or pulls it, right? A pencil that's sitting on the desk is going to just keep sitting on the desk. We would all be, sh and if you're like, say, playing hockey or playing a game with it or something, you, whatever decisions you would quickly make in your mind, you would not make them based on the assumption. You would not expect a pen sitting on a table or a puck sitting on a table to just spontaneously just start moving to the left at 30 miles an hour. That's crazy, right? We all know that. Okay. But if we're all comfortable with that, that an object at rest should not spontaneously change what it's doing and now become un at rest. Well, well, wait a minute then. What about an object that's on the table while you're walking by the table? Just imagine you start walking by a table, right? And you're looking, oh, sorry, I'm just fixing the clock. And you're walking by a table that has a hockey puck on it, right? Now you're walking by. Now from your frame of reference, from your frame, if you're walking to the east, that hockey puck, and it, say you're moving at constant velocity to the east, right? Or, or, or if you don't like that, if you think that's too contrived, like you're in an airplane with an object, right? And someone else is on the ground. You're in an airplane with an object. Now, you might say that that object is at rest on your tray table. You might say it's at rest. Well, it's at rest relative to you, but none of your friends who are down in the airport think you're at rest, right? Like, I don't know who thinks who's crazy. What physics is saying is nobody's crazy. To you, the object on the tray table is at rest. To the people on the ground, it's not at rest. So where am I going with this? I'm saying, if you would not expect the object on your tray table to just suddenly hook left and start moving, right? If you think that would be crazy, then by the exact same token, doesn't that mean the people that are, or you're in a subway or you're on an escalator that other people are watching, like just create a situation where to you, something is at rest, but to someone else, it's not at rest. Wouldn't the person who's, who's like, who's on the ground watching you in the airplane or you're like you're on TV and they have closed circuit cameras, whatever, if they're watching something on your tray table, what they expect is like, they'd be shocked if suddenly the thing on your tray table, suddenly with no turbulence or anything like that, just started coming towards you, right? If it did start coming towards you, they would assume that's because the plane did something weird, right? Right? In other words, in, a, in other words, they don't expect something on your tray table to start slowing down and coming to the rest at all. They expect it to keep moving from their perspective, right? And their perspective is no more right or wrong than yours. Again, you could say you, yours is correct because I don't know why you would say that. I mean, you're in an airplane, right? Or you could they could say theirs is correct, but I don't know why they would say that they're on planet earth, which is hurtling past the sun at 65 fat. What I'm trying to say is to, if to you, something sitting still, if you think it'd be weird for it to spontaneously move, well, then that's exactly the same logic that someone's running past it would think it would be really weird for it to spontaneously slow down. They don't think, uh, nobody actually expects objects by themselves to spontaneously change the way they are moving. What Newton is saying here is, if you really take Galileo seriously and no object in and of itself has its own velocity that's either zero or not zero, that all velocities are comparisons, relations between objects, then anything we would expect of a stationary object, we should expect of a moving object because actually there's no difference because stationary or moving is just in the eye of who's making the observation. It's not intrinsic to the object. So I, so I know it's 122 already. What I'm trying to, so I'm really saying, we could talk about the air hockey technicalities and measurement and all that. What I'm really saying is Gal, Newton comes along and says, oh my God, Galileo has a real point here. So the fifth, I'm uh, sorry, the sixth form of Galileo's principle is objects at rest should act exactly the same way as objects in motion, which is that left to their own devices, they should maintain constant velocity. Object, uh, summary of all this, the summary is, if we take Galileo seriously, Galileo, principle of relativity, form number six now, this is the sixth form we see. And you see each form has a different implication and kind of makes your head, but each one, if you really think through these forms, they're all just logical extensions of one idea. This is a, the thing of physics, which is make physics either cool or not cool, depending if you like it or don't like it. But physics is just one big thread, one big story where the mathematical details get more complex, but it's all, it's never, we're never just discovering something like out of nowhere. It's all a thread of logic. And the thread here is GPR form number six is basically saying an object left alone, a, a single object 
left alone will maintain constant velocity. Will, in fact, I'm going to put it better, will not accelerate. Objects don't spontaneously accelerate. That's what the law is saying. The first law is saying. So then, I know we only have six minutes, so I'll cut to the chase. So then law number two is, well, I mean, do, are we saying objects never accelerate? No, we're not saying objects never accelerate. We're saying left alone, they don't. In order for an object to accelerate, it has to be subjected to a net external force. So uh, object number two is now what happens when, I mean, I mean, law number two is what happens so this is Newton's law number two. What happens when a mass is subjected to a net external force? What happens, as you've heard before, is this. When an object is subjected to a net external force, when a mass, it, it will accelerate. And in fact, the acceleration is directly proportional to the magnitude of the net external force. The harder you push something, the more it accelerates. There are a lot of details. There are a lot of details uh, involved in the arrow, like uh, saying this is a vector equation. So it's really, it's really three simultaneous yet independent equations. What it really is, is the sum of all the horizontal forces acting on a mass will produce its horizontal um, acceleration while at the same time, but independently, the sum of all the vertical forces, the Y axis, will produce the vertical acceleration. And if there's a third axis, which there may well be in physical space, then the sum of all the Z forces will produce the Z acceleration. There's Now, this is the big problem-solving one. Again, I know you started in lab already, or I believe you did. We're obviously I'm going to expand a lot on this uh, this Wednesday, but just in the, because we have five minutes left. But so far, I'm saying law number one is what happens when an object is not interacting with another object, when it's not being pushed or pulled by anything outside of it, i.e. by any other object. That's what the first law is about. The second law says what happens when objects are subjected to that external forces, i.e. pushes or pulls. But of course, I keep uh, uh, skirting around the issue of what exactly do I mean by a force or what exactly is that external influence, blah, blah, blah. So that's where the third law comes in. So of, of course, we're going to expand heavily on the second law in the days to come. But just to get this all on paper and out there before the class ends, the third law, the third law really defines in, operationally for us what we mean by a force. So the third law says this, and this is where, we'll, and the third law says, if object A exerts a force on object B, then Object B exerts a force on object A of identical magnitude and in opposite direction. You've heard this before. Of, co of course, you've heard all of this before. I mean, most of you or read it or something. Many people will call this like the action reaction law, or they'll say for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. We're going to discuss what I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying that's like deceptively problematically vague. To say every action um, yields an equal and opposite reaction includes a lot of cases. It brings to mind a lot of examples that are in fact not true. The, so please write it this way. This thing is saying something much more specific and true. What this is saying, and we have two minutes left, I'm gonna do one more page. If you need me to go back in a second, I will. But what this thing is saying is, if I push you, you push me back in exactly the same way. If I push the wall, the wall pushes me back in exactly the same way. I mean, opposite direction, but same magnitude. If I tug on a rope, the rope, in other words, it it's a, it's saying, what the third law is saying is, it's saying, 
according a a force is a symmetric interaction between between two object it's not a property of one sound familiar remember we said velocity is a relation between two objects it's not a property of one now we're saying a force is an interaction between two objects and in fact a symmetric one uh, uh, just like velocity i might add this sounds very much like vab equals negative vba yes not coincidentally this i'm saying this is ultimately the definition of what a force really is again we're going to pick this up on wednesday but what this really is is gpr form number seven no joke it's taking that same it's saying you can't have a force you can't be a force you you can exert a force on something else. A force is a push or a pull. It's an interaction. A force is something I do to you. And when I do it to you, you do it to me exactly the same way. It is necessarily symmetric. Whether I pushed you or you pushed me is a matter of whose frame of reference you're in. It's just like, and it's a matter of definition. It's not discovery. It's This is what we mean by force. It's like, and I know it's one third, I'm just say this and then we'll go. Like I married my wife on October 20th, right? Surprise, surprise, my wife married me on October 20th. Can you believe that? Isn't that amazing coincidence? No, of course it's not a coincidence. It's exactly what we mean by marriage, right? Say the force is like that. If I push you, you push me back. It doesn't matter who thought of the idea of pushing or whatever. Usually we're talking about inanimate objects. A force is an interaction between two objects. It is symmetric. It's just like velocity. If I go past you, you go past me in this opposite direction with the same magnitude. Okay, we're going to end. I know that's like a lot, or maybe it's a little, I don't know. Anyway, we're going to stop. I'm done. If you want to ask any questions about this, you can. Otherwise, have a nice night. There's no new homework. Um, I mean, other than the game turn, there's, so yes, have a nice night. Um, thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Have a good day. Okay. Um, awesome. Uh, have a great day. Yes. Good. Have a great day. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'm turning off the recording also. Oh.